we're going to start with the topic of a balancing act to deliver water to your tap. And Oh, okay. <laughs> Ken was over here and all of a sudden I lost my speaker. So presenting on this will be Ken Manning. Now I think almost everyone here in the audience probably knows Ken. He's been working in water in the San Gabriel Valley for decades. He's the executive director of the San Gabriel Basin Water Quality Authority. He became the executive director of the Water Authority in March of 2011. Prior to that, he served as a board member for the authority and as the CEO of the Chino Basin Water Master. He has also served as a board member for Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District, president of the Association of Groundwater Agencies, and is currently the chair of the California Groundwater Coalition. He holds a bachelor's of science degree in architectural design from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a master's of public administration from Cal State Northridge. Please join me in welcoming Ken. Thank you, Cynthia. I'm going to try and get this uh, level of mic to work here. Um, while I'm fiddling with this, or not, is there a switch on there? On. That should. Yeah. I like to move around a little bit while I'm talking, so. Um, so as I, as I uh, get a chance to show you some of the slides that I've put together for the presentation here today, um, I can get a, get a chance to get some eye contact. Um, what Cynthia didn't explain or, or go in, term, in terms of my past is that I have the very, I'm very fortunate in that I have lived almost my entire life in the San Gabriel Valley. And my parents lived almost their entire life in the San Gabriel Valley and had roots in water. Now, my father was one of the first board members of the Upper San Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District and was a member of the Water Master here in the San Gabriel Basin for many, many years, going back into the 1960s and 70s. But also, I have other relatives who are active in the water industry. Those of you who are, some of you are, I saw, um, from the sand and gravel industry here today. Um, my great uncles were one of the first rock and sand companies here in Irwindale, Manning Brothers Rock and Sand. So we have a lot of roots in the water industry here, and so I guess that was the reason I got volunteered to try and do this very um, interesting um, task of trying to bring everybody in this audience up to a point where you understand water policy as, it's, as it sits today. So I'm here today to try and lead this class and bring you up today, give you a history of what it is that we've been doing. So. Um, this is the title that I was given uh, as we started talking about what we wanted to do in terms of pre presenting this as a topic and the balancing act to deliver water to your tap. Well, as I started to do my research, this is really how the title of my, my talk ended up here. And this is a look at how water policy in the San Gabriel Valley was shaped by events, both man-made and natural. Because as we walk through the history of the San Gabriel Valley, you're going to see there were a number of events that shaped where we are today. So where do we start? First of all, let's get an understanding of what we're talking about, the San Gabriel Basin. So here's a picture of, from, from space of the San Gabriel Basin. The black line represents the boundaries of the area we're talking about. Now, these are not political boundaries. These are geologic boundaries. And the areas that are outside of that area are outside because they're not interacting with the San Gabriel Basin. We're looking at a giant bathtub here filled of sand and gravel and clay that also happens to have a lot of water down in it. And we're living on this crust of this giant bathtub that provides all of us with groundwater. As a matter of fact, 90% of the groundwater, 90% uh, of the use of water in the San Gabriel Basin comes from this groundwater basin. It's a huge groundwater basin, about the size in terms of, of area of the, the Lake Tahoe. So we're talking about a large bathtub. And Matter of fact, in California, there are 518 bathtubs like this. Uh, ours happens to be one of the largest. Imagine what it looked like back in, 16, um, in 1769 when Father Sarah and Captain Portolo set foot into the San Gabriel Valley on this mission that they were on to try and establish this series of outposts throughout Alta, California, northern nor or Alta, Mexico, which is the area that we are in. Um, 
if you read through this, you'll notice there's some interesting observations. First of all, as they stepped down into this valley, they were looking at an area of spacious grass, but the grass was burned. Also, marshy areas that they fame came across. They experienced an earthquake on the first day in the San Gabriel Valley. <laughs> interesting. The other thing that I thought was interesting is their reference to the Puente, which is really the first reference to an area or a region within the San Gabriel Basin that we can find as recorded, because the area they're referring to is the area that turned out to be Puente. It didn't become La Puente until it incorporated many years later. It was always Puente. Father Sierra, Father Sarah, uh, officiated at the, at the naming of this permanent settlement in the San Gabriel Valley. Most people think that was up in San Gabriel, Mission San Gabriel. It wasn't. It was down in Whittier Narrows. The first mission San Gabriel, or first mission in the San Gabriel was down in Whittier Narrows. Why did they move it? Well, as it turns out, that was the very first public water policy decision in the San Gabriel Valley because it flooded in, in 1772 and 1773 in the Whittier Narrows. They couldn't leave the mission there or it would, have been, it would have been wiped out very soon. So they moved it about five miles north up to the area that we now consider to be the, the city of uh, San Gabriel, um, just south of the Raymond Dyke there. That ushered in an area that I, era that I call the mission era, lasted for a little over 50 years. And you can kind of picture this San Gabriel Valley, fairly virgin land. Agricultural crops were, were um, the predominant areas that around the mission were being developed as crops. Vineyards, of course. I mean, this is a church. Going to have to have wine, so they've got vineyards. Some grapes and oranges um, were, were there, but livestock uh, was, pri was, was, the, was the main um, product that they were trying to cultivate here in the San Gabriel Basin back in the, in the 1770s up into 1834. Um, hides were kind of the bartering system. They were using hides to barter. But that's what the first diversion of water happened here in the San Gabriel Valley. Before that, water just moved down the San Gabriel River and, and the, the native uh, Gabrielino Indians. As a matter of fact, there were about 7,000 uh, Gabrielino Indians in, in the valley at the point in time when Father Sarah established the mission here in uh, San Gabriel. And they, uh, the partnership with the, with the Indians, I'll call it that, I'm not sure it was really a partnership. The partnership with the Indians uh, developed a, a culture here where uh, crops were being developed and, uh, and we, were, we were starting this whole development of the San Gabriel Valley. But they were diverting water into what they called zangas, dirt ditches, that's all they were, zangas. And they were later, as they get closer to 1834, they were, they were replaced with, with clay pipes. Still a lot of slow growth going on in the San Gabriel Basin. Um, we moved into this rancho era. Now, a lot of people associate the San Gabriel Valley in Southern California with this rancho era, but in fact, that era was relatively short. It wasn't a long time. Now, when Father Sarah moved into California to establish the missions, remember, we were, this, this area was a part of Spain. It wasn't a part of Mexico, it was a part of Spain. And Spain was interested in having a presence here. Well, Mexico gained its independence in 1822, and with that came a, a change in land policy. They all of a sudden wanted to have a greater presence in Alta, Mexico. They wanted to make sure that, that people in the, the northern part of their territories had a connection that we, because they were afraid that the Russians coming south down the coast uh, were going to take over and, and populate the portion of, of their territory known as Alta, Mexico. So ranchos were encouraged. And during this period of time, we saw the development of of some interesting folks that came into the valley. Um, people like Ignacio Polomaris and Richard Vejar, that's the area they, they took uh, ranchos in the areas near Pomona. Uh, Roland and Workman, um, large area in what is now a pointy city of industry area. Louis Arenas, um, Azusa Baldwin Park area. Um, interesting guy, he was the first mayor of the city of Los Angeles, by the way. Um, uh, Hugo Reed um, was the area kind of around Arcadia. Uh, Henry Dalton, um, interesting character, um, played an important history in water in the San Gabriel Basin. Uh, he acquired his property from Reed and Arenas. Now, as I was reading through and doing my research on this, I found that he got the property, but there really isn't any record whether he bought it or he won it in a card game. Um, 
But he did get the property, and he gained title to it, and he, had, he played a tremendous role in the water here in the San Gabriel Basin. And in, another interesting guy is Benjamin Davis Wilson. Um, this guy kept showing up as I was doing my research. Benjamin Davis Wilson. Areas of Pasadena, San Gabriel, Arcadia, those areas were areas where he was, uh, had a large tract of land. But he's an interesting character in history. First of all, he grew up in Tennessee, moved out here to California, and his first tract of land happened to be what is now the city of Riverside. His wife died while he was there and moved to the San Gabriel Valley because he was really wanted to get away from Riverside because of this situation with his, his wife had passed away. He moved to the San Gabriel Valley and was a fairly innovative guy. He had a son-in-law who was an engineer, and they teamed up and did a lot of work in the San Gabriel Valley. Well, he, he definitely le left his mark in California. Um, Wilson, Mount Wilson, is named after Benjamin Wilson. He also happens to be the grandfather of General George S. Patton. And he was the second mayor of the city of Los Angeles. But with this diversion of water and all of these ranchos came greater pressure on the water systems here in the San Gabriel Basin. So we start to see more diversions. Kind of a depiction of what rancho life was like back in, in that period of time. A lot of, a lot of cattle uh, roping and, and working with cattle and livestock. Um, but you can imagine, these ranchos were a long distance apart. Pomona, Duarte, Pasadena, La Puente. And these people didn't see each other. They were just inhabiting the same geographic region. So now we move into an area 1848 to 1870, which is really I call the gold rush era, for lack of any better term. Uh, the Treaty of Hildago uh, happened in 1848, where the areas of what is now California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, etc., moved out of the hands of Mexico into the United States as a, as a, as a part of war. The United States and Mexico in 1845 um, went to war, and as a result of that, that portion of Mexico moved into the hands of the United States. Now, it's interesting, that's about half the territory of what was then Mexico moved into, the, into becoming territories of the United States. But it was less than 1% of the population of Mexico. So in terms of making the decision to cut off the property that they owned going north and making peace using that property as the barter with which they were able to make peace was really not a difficult decision at all because less than 1% of their population lived in this area. Well, at the same time, later that year, gold was discovered in Northern California. And, in, and uh, that created a different demand here in California for products. Now, all of a sudden, the cattle industry here in the San Gabriel Basin became very important. Cattle was selling at $2, $1, $2, $3, $3 a head. All of a sudden, it's now $70 a head. And all of a sudden, cattle became a big industry because they had to feed those people who were moving into the Northern California for both the gold rush and also, by the way, the silver mines of, of New Mexico or of Nevada. So crops were important. The other thing that changed was, was that the state and federal laws now were governing ownership of land, ownership of property. Well, that also means water. So the rules changed in the San Gabriel Basin throughout California on how we deal with water. Another interesting event happened in 1862 during this period of time. There was a massive flood. As a matter of fact, it said that almost 200,000 cows died in the flood of 1862. One other thing that happened in 1862 as a result of this flood, the Rio Hondo River was created. The Rio Hondo River did not exist in California, in the San Gabriel Valley, until 1862. Railroads and land development, 1870s to 1900. The population in 1870 of, of Los Angeles from 1870 to 1880 was roughly 10,000 people. There were a few outposts throughout San Gabriel Valley. Um, if you read about them, it was, it's very interesting. Some, some are very col colorful. Um, I was reading about El Monte, which is, at the time was called Monte. It wasn't El Monte, it was Monte. Um, and they had uh, a pretty much a vigilante uh, uh, mentality in the, in the community of Monte. And at that point in time, there was a group called the Monte Boys. It was nothing more than a vigilante group that was keeping track of, of what was going on. It was a gang um, in the 1880s. 